Amen. Well, if you will, take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Numbers in chapter 14. Numbers in chapter 14 this morning. Numbers chapter 14 will be in verse 39 and we'll read through verse 45. Once you find Numbers 14, those that are able, if you'll stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy, His infallible, His inerrant, and His preserved word. Numbers chapter 14, verse 39. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel. And the people mourned greatly, and they rose up early in the morning and gat them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, uh, we be here and will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Verse 41. And Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presume to go up uh, unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Verse 45, And the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt, that, dwelt in that hill, and smote them, and discomfited them, even unto Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to come and to stand before you, dear God. Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you consume this place and consume hearts, Lord. God, we pray, dear God, that you would move in a mighty way, that you'd remove all hindrances, Lord, anything that's grieved you today in our hearts, Lord. Forgive us of it. Cleanse us of it, Lord. God, we realize this morning that we need the anointing power of the Holy Spirit of God uh, should anything be accomplished. So, God, we pray. Bless thy word. God, we pray that you'd move in a mighty way, dear God. Keep us yielded to your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we come to Numbers 14. We've been here for quite some time, but we, we come again this morning with a message that I want to call fake repentance. A message called fake repentance. Uh, we understand that the main idea, I think, that we want to gather this morning from this uh, particular verses is that true repentance is an inward motive, not an outward action alone. True repentance is an inward motive, not an outward action alone. True repentance is something that happens internally to us, to where we are not only we're not just guilt, guilted because of sin, but it means that we are repentant and sorrowful for our sins with a godly sorrow. And we are so sorrowful, not just guilty, not just guilted, but we're sorrowful for what we've done before in Almighty God. And it produces an outward action of repentance as well. But it starts with the heart and it starts with God. I'm afraid that much of the repentance that we see in America today, uh, because it's become such glamorized uh, religiosity today and so much false uh, movements and there's so much, uh, there's so much, Manipulation on the altar calls today. And you see, today you could be a good, uh, you could be a, a, a good uh, uh, psy, psy, psychiatrist today, and you could probably get people to move to an altar uh, if we were to manipulate the minds of people and we were to stir the emotions just right. Man will move because of emotions. You do know that, right? And uh, some of y'all, y'all won't give uh, uh, to anything unless you, it's the Christmas time when you see the person out there shaking a the little bell at the door and you don't really don't want to give anything to them but you know what you'll do, you'll let them guilt you when they sit there and stare at you as they go by and you, you'll be so guilted that it'll stir your emotions and you'll throw some money in the, in the barrel. Same thing can happen in, re, in religion and I'm afraid that much of what we see today is fake repentance. I think of a story of a man that woke up in the morning and he was deep, re, deeply repentant after a bitter fight with his wife the night before. And uh, he noticed uh, with dismay the crate of empty beer bottles that was in his kitchen floor. And uh, so what did he do? He knew that those beer bottles had caused the fight. So he took them outside and he started smashing the empty bottles all over the ground on the cement. And what did he do? He took that empty crate of beer bottles and he smashed the first one uh, first, smashed the first bottle and he began to swear. He said, you're the reason I fight with my wife. Then he grabbed a second beer bottle that was empty and what did he say? He said, you're the reason I don't love my children as I should. 
and he grabbed a third beer bottle and he threw it down on the ground and shattered it and he said, you're the reason I don't have a decent job. Then he went and he to pick up the fourth beer bottle and what happened? He realized that the bottle was still sealed and it was still full. It hadn't been drunk, not an ounce of it out. And he hesitated for a moment and then he said, you stand aside, I know you were not involved in this event. And you know, as, as humorous as that might be, it's pretty sad because there's a lot of people this morning in that same shape. And they've got some, uh, they've had some, some, some chaos in their life last night and they're guilty over it and they're guilted by it, but they don't have true repentance, do they? Because when it comes down to it, they'll look at the root of the sin is that it's lostness and it's in a, a, a beer bottle or an alcohol a bottle or a, a medicine tube today. And uh, they'll want to deal with the effects of it, but they're not really sorrowful because they, they want to keep cracking that seal on that bottle in a little bit. You see, true repentance and true sorrow is something that completely changes. One, the motives are changed internally, but it also changes the outward actions. As we look this morning, we, we need to understand the context again. Most of y'all have been here. You should understand this now, but repetition really helps us out, doesn't it? What's going on? God has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They were in bondage. They were in slavery there for over 400 years. God, in his time of fulfillment, has saw it's time to bring them out. He had kept them there that they would be isolated and that they would be a unified people and they wouldn't be scattered all over the world. Why? Because he was going to use that little nation of Israel to give us the word of God. You do understand that if it wasn't for the Jew, you wouldn't have a Bible. Today, we, we need to thank God for the Jewish people and how he used that nation to reveal himself to the world. If it wasn't for the tiny nation of Israel, we wouldn't know God the Father today. If we were just left with the New Testament, we come to the New Testament without the Old, we don't even know who God the Father is or how He responds to people or anything about His characteristics. So I guess what I'm doing there is I'm just giving a little jab to those fools who say we don't need the Old Testament anymore because without the Old Testament, we wouldn't have the complete understanding of Almighty God. Here in Numbers 14, God has brought them out of slavery. He's brought them and gave them the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. They leave Sinai, and now they have pursued over uh, to... Kadesh Barnea, and they're looking into the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan was the promised land that was promised to Israel. It was promised many years before to faithful Abraham. When God told Abraham, he said, if you'll be faithful to me, I'll give this land to you, and uh, you'll be as prosperous uh, as the, the sand on the seashores, and you'll be a blessing to all people. I'd say the nation of Israel has been a blessing to us, hasn't it? We look and we see today that here it is, it's time, and God said, I'm fixing to give you the land. All you've got to do is go in and, and take it. There's going to be warfare. There's going to be fighting. There's mighty nations there. They're going to fight you, but don't worry about it because I'm with you. Same God that brought you across the Red Sea and brought you out of Egypt. Impossible task. It's the same God that's going to help you do this impossible task to go into the land. And we remember that uh, what happened is that there were spies sent into the land, and they stayed there 40 days. The spies come back. And we understand that when the spies brought back the, the artifacts from the land, they also brought a negative word and said, we don't think we can take this. Ten of them anyway. But there was two that were faithful. Two of those 12 spies were faithful. Ten were unfaithful. And because of that, the people of Israel rebelled against God's will. They said, we're not going into the land. God, we're not going to follow your word. We're not going to follow your prophecy. You've brought us all this way. But you know what, God? It'd be better for us to go back to the world and go back and live in Israel. It would be safer for our children, as they used the excuse, for them to be raised in the world rather than raised in the power and spirit of God. And rather than having the victorious Christian life in Canaan, now they're going to dwell for 40 years in the barren desert in the rebellious Christian life. Can I tell you, there's consequences for sin. And it's important that we follow God and obey His will for us. We look and we see that true repentance is an inward motive, not only in outward action. But what we, as we look at this today, we look at the children of Israel, and what we understand is that in the previous verses up to verse 39, God steps in and He says, Okay, I'm tired of this people, Moses, and what I'm going to do is I am going to put them in the wilderness for 40 years. For every day that those spies went into the land and searched it out, they're going to stay in the wilderness for a year for every day those spies went in and, uh, and uh, uh, pursued that land. And uh, they're going to stay there and until the generation that is 19 and under uh, will be the only generation that goes in. But until the generation that is 20 and over is completely died out, the people will not go into the land. 
Can I tell you this? That your sins will affect your children and your future generations. And that's enough motivation right there to live godly for Jesus Christ. Friend, I want you to understand, uh, we need to be praying for our grandchildren. We need to be praying for our children. We need to be praying for our great-great-grandchildren. And quite often, I find myself praying right on down for generations, right on down, great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren. Uh, God, I pray your blessing upon my grandsons. I pray you bless the womb of my daughter. And I pray that you bless the seed of my son and his eventually, uh, eventually his wife. Bless the womb, and as they produce forth mighty, mighty men of God and mighty, mighty women of God that do great works. Friend, I want you to understand this thing ain't about you, just you and you having your best life now. I'm sorry, Joel Osteen. This thing's a lot, lot bigger than you. It's a lot bigger than you. It's about the glory of God, and it is about many more that's coming behind you. Friend, I want you to understand today that here Israel makes an awful mistake, and then you know what they try to do? They try to cover it up. After God said, all right, you're not going into the land. I'm not going to be with you. You're going to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. You know what they did then? When God said go, they said no. When God said no, they said go. They did just the opposite. The flesh always works against the will of God. We look and we see that what repentance is, real repentance defined is this. Means to, it means to turn away from sin and turn toward God for forgiveness and renewal. To turn away from sin and to turn toward God uh, for forgiveness and for renewal. You see, a lot of that today, people think that, that forgiveness is just that I for, I'm forgiven of my sins and I continue in my sins. Friend, don't you understand that true repentance will be a turning away from the things that you, you have been sorrowful over and living differently for God. But friend, I want you to understand today that this repentance that we see, it was fake. Because we'll see here in verses 39 through 45 that what did they do? They said, all right, we're going up. We're going up to the mountain in the morning time, and we're going to go in just like God told us to do. And Moses said, don't y'all do that. God's not going to be with you. You missed your mark. You missed your time, your opportunity. God's not going to be with you. You know what they said? They said, no, we're going in the flesh. We're not going in faith. But they had done failed the opportunity to go in faith. Now they were going in the flesh. Can I tell you that the flesh cannot achieve the things of the spiritual man when he is led by Almighty God. And here they move forward in the faith. And this repentance that they have, uh, it was fake. You want to know why it was fake? Well, let's look at the scripture today and let's find a few reasons that the reason this repentance that they had up on that mountainside, that it was fake. First of all, it was fake in verses 31 through 35. It was not initiated by God. Kyle, how do you know that this repentance they had all of a sudden to do what God had told them to do, that it was fake? Look at verse 31 through 35. Verse 31, but ye, this is God speaking. He's given the judgment of the people to Moses. But your little ones, which ye uh, said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness for forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye search to land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know uh, my uh, breach of promise. Verse 35, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation. God said, I'm going to do it. Judgment has been sealed. You're not going into the land. You're going to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. Actually, it would be from the day that they left. This would be 38 more, but 40 years in total, they would wander in the wilderness. Now, we understand that this repentance in verses 39 through 45, to where they decide that they're going to go into the land, we know that it was a fake repentance because, first of all, it was not initiated by God. How do you know it was not initiated by God? Because in verse 42, what does it say in verse 42? Go not up, the Lord is not among you. The Lord is what? Not among you. This repentance was not initiated by God. Friend, I want you to understand that true repentance is always initiated by God. It is not just man coming to a grips and saying, hey, I need, to, I need to do better. I need to do better. Hey, the drug addicts say that every day before they take their next hit. The drunkard says that this morning as he wakes up. And the reason he says, I need to quit this is because his head stopped up with all them cigarettes he smoked last night and breathing in all that secondhand smoke from all over the bar. And all of those Budweiser's he drank last night, his head's hurting, his body's dragging. And he's saying, boy, I need to quit this. I'm getting too old for this. He's repentant, but he ain't repentant. 
He's just guilty. And he's worried about all of these consequences because of it. Friend, we see here that this was not true repentance. It was fake repentance because it was not initiated by God. Any true repentance will be initiated by Almighty God. Not only was it not initiated by God, but secondly, it was not accompanied by faith. It was not accompanied by faith. We look and we see in verse 11 of chapter 14, if you'll look there with me, in chapter 14, verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be error in error they believe uh, in error they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them the people lacked faith to believe God in this whole event we see that they lacked faith to believe God at his word they came to an opportunity of faith and they were going to either believe God at his word and, and go into the land of Can land of Canaan's over here, by the way. Y'all notice I always look over here to the right top when I say Canaan. Let's say it's over here this time. But no, it's over here. And Egypt's over here on that side. And, uh, and Canaan's over here, the victorious Christian life, right? These are living the good things. Y'all are living into the evil. But nonetheless, what do we see? God gave them the opportunity of faith to journey in faith for God, and they had resisted it. But now they are going forward and trying to go forward in the flesh rather than in faith they had demonstrated no faith towards God in this whole event in chapter 13 and chapter 14 but they had rebelled against God and what I'm telling you I know that this try to, trying to repeat what God had told them to do now this sudden repentance all of a sudden by the people that it was fake is because it was not accompanied by faith well let's make our point here Mark chapter 1 and verse 15 if you look let me read to you very quickly Jesus' first words in Mark chapter 1 verse 15 the very first message that he gave after his baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist his first verse his first speech after his initiation to his ministry on earth he said this the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand what is he saying Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. I want you to understand that true repentance and true salvation is a product of two in one. It is repentance and faith. You cannot separate repentance and faith. If you had a coin this morning, what's it got? It's got two sides, hasn't it? It's got a side with heads on it. It's got a side with tails if you're talking about American currency. And, but it takes both of those sides to be a whole coin, doesn't it? That's the same thing it is, way it is with repentance and faith. That salvation and repentance require both repentance and belief. They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. People, some people believe that you can receive salvation without faith, but if you will just repent... Be sorry for what you've done and be sorry for the actions and try to make it right without faith and belief in God that you could be saved. That's a heresy. Uh, some people believe just the other way, that if I just believe in God without repentance that I can be saved. But simply belief alone in God uh, is not salvation if it's not come with repentance. You see, when the work of salvation has been complete and full in a person's life, there will be the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ to know Him, but there will also be a turning and a change and a transformation in one's heart, in one's life, and in their lifestyle. Repentance and belief. And here, what do we see? We know that this is a fake repentance that they do up there at Kadesh Barnea because it was not accompanied by faith because they have been, they're now they're now demonstrating an act of repentance, but they're still not demonstrating faith. Because if they had demonstrated faith, God would no doubt have answered in their, their uh, ordeal here. Look, and we see that uh, I know that this repentance was fake because it was not initiated by God. Secondly, it was not accompanied by faith. But thirdly, they had not dealt with their sin. They had not dealt with their sin. Look at verse 39. What does it say there? It says, the people mourned greatly. Verse 39, go there again. And Moses told the saying unto the children. In other words, once he had told them that the judgment for them was to walk in the wilderness for 40 years in barren dry desert, they were receiving their judgment. They didn't like that. Now all of a sudden, they have the change of heart. Oh no, what does it say there? And the people mourned greatly. Well, that looks like an act of repentance, doesn't it? They began to cry in sorrow. 
Can I tell you, there's a, there's a bunch of drunkards crying this morning, but they're going to go right back to the bottle here in about an hour or two once the race comes on or once the ball team comes on and once they get settled down and leveled out and get all of that sorrow and emotion out of their heart from what they did last night. They'll forget it. They'll wipe it off and they'll go back to the same old way. And friend, there's a, there's a lot of people who are, who, who are crying this morning and sorrowful this morning for something they said or something they did yesterday. But you know what? They'll go back and say the same things this evening and do the same things tomorrow. There's some people that are tired. They're, they're sorry for they gossiped and they got caught but they're not sorry for the gospel. We look and we see here that we know that, that they had a, a that they were a, a fake repentance here because they had not dealt with their sin. Uh, they mourned because of their judgment in the verse, verse 39, not because they had offended a holy God. They had a, Mourned greatly in verse 39, let me say it again, not because uh, that they uh, had offended a holy God, they were mourning because of the judgment that was coming against them. You see it in the verse, it says, and Moses uh, told these sayings, these sayings were the judgment of God. And then all of a sudden, when they realized that God was not happy with them, and that God was going to judge them, they said, no, 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 because we got in trouble, let's start doing right. You see, they, were, they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't mourning because, man, we have sinned against the holy God that brought us out of Israel. We have sinned. You know what we did? We said that it would be better for, God, for our children to be raised by the world than to be raised in the victorious Christian life in Canaan by God. Well, we have offended God. Oh, my God. Friend, I want you to understand that is the attitude of true repentance. But theirs was not true repentance. You would even say, you might even could battle with me on that in verse 40. Look there at verse 40 with me. And it says in the last sentence of verse 40, uh, it says, For we have sinned. For we have sinned. Even sounds like an attitude of repentance, doesn't it? That's what it sounds like. But we know that this was not a repentant attitude. It was not a repentant attitude because it was based on the judgment of God and not on the offense that they had done to Almighty God. They were sad because they had got caught. Y'all ever been sad because you got caught? Oh, I've been sad because I got caught. I can go back to school and I can go back to all kinds of things in life that I wasn't remorseful for what I had done. I was just mad because I got caught. Sorry because I, yeah, you like that too? I see some of y'all up high like y'all holy rollers over there. This right side, I got to watch this Canaan side over here. They think they, no, I'm just kidding. I'm cutting up. But what we see this morning is that the reason that they uh, were sorrowful was not because they had offended the holy God, but because they had got caught and now God was bringing judgment. They wanted the judgment gone. They said, well, if it's going to be walking in the desert for 40 years, I reckon, not by faith, but I reckon we would rather go fight Canaanites than to have to walk in the desert. And that was the attitude. This was fake repentance. True repentance is a resort from what you have done to God, not what God has done to you. True repentance is a resort of what you have done to God and not what God has done to you. True repentance sparks when you say, man, I have done God wrong. The God that sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, I have cursed him. I have went against him. I have lived unrighteously against him. It's not when God's going to bring judgment or you got caught doing something. And you say, oh, God's, I'm stimulated by what God's doing to me. And then that motivates me to turn. That's not true repentance. And here the true repentance, the, 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 the repentance that stimulated them was because of the judgment that was being against them, not because of what they had done against God. Are y'all all with me out there? Say amen. Thinking about this thought that they had not dealt with their sin is a reason that we understand uh, that it was fake repentance. Thinking upon that still, uh, there was no remorse. There was no remorse. You don't see remorse in their attitudes. You still see arrogance in their attitudes because even when, when, when Moses, or excuse me, yeah, even when Moses uh, had uh, said, don't go into the land, God is done with that. Don't you go forward anymore. God will not be with you. What did they do in arrogance? They said, God's going to be with us because we've decided we're going now. You see, they had put their place in a place of priority and authority that they did not have. They thought that they were commanding God, not that God com was commanding them. Now that they had decided, yeah, we can go into the land, because it's better for us, not because it's better for God. Now they were arrogantly pursuing forward. 
but there was no remorse in their attitudes towards God that you can find in this passage. If you find it, you let me know. There was no remorse. Psalms 51 and verse 4, uh, David said this. Uh, David said in Psalms 51, 4, he said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David, when he had been called in his awful deed of prayer with Bathsheba, a prayer of repentance was this, Against thee, God, have I sinned. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. You see that he wasn't saying, Oh, God, what you did to me. Oh, it hurts, God, that, that you took the baby and you killed the baby and now I've got this curse. No, he wasn't saying anything. He said, God, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. You see, that true repentance is remorseful. It's sorrowful for what you have done to an almighty God, not what God has done to you. I think about that and I'll read to you in 2 Corinthians in chapter 7. We find an, an illustration of godly sorrow. In other words, true repentance. Uh, you would remember in 1 Corinthians, the whole book of 1 Corinthians, Paul sent a heated letter to the Corinthians, and he scolded them, son, I'm telling you, he took them to the woodshed, and he was hard on them. And I'm telling you, he wrote a second letter to calm them down a little bit. He said, he said listen, what I, I know I was rough, but I, it was all in love. And that's what we're looking at here. These people had all kinds of sins going on. They even had a member of the church who was, who was in relationship with his mother-in-law, mother stepmother-in-law. And uh, our stepmother, his father's wife, not his mother, but his father's wife. And it was sick and gruesome, and Paul came in in 1 Corinthians, and he hammered them. But that rebuke brought a godly sorrow, not a fake sorrow. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 7, we see it in verse 8. Verse 8, for though I made you sorry with a letter, 1 Corinthians, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. He said, boy, I made you sorry, but it was good because it was a godly sorrow. Verse 9, now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to what? Repentance. That you sorrowed to repentance. This rebuke brought them to a sorrow, not just a guiltiness that they had done wrong, but it brought them to a sorrow in their hearts that they repented before God for the wrong that they were doing before God and denying Him His proper glory in the local congregation. Re sorrow to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow, look at what godly sorrow produced. Produces. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Uh, what does we see? We see contrasted in verse 10, the sorrow of God that brings people to repentance to get things right between them and God and right with the things that they had done wrong. But there is a sorrow of the world that he mentions in verse 10 that leads to death. Can I tell you that here in Numbers chapter 14, this fake repentance was leading them to death not unto life. It was not a godly sorrow because they were not sorry and remorseful for what they had done to God. There was no remorse in their hearts. We look and we see again that they had not dealt with their sin. How do you know? Because there was no remorse. But next, there was no reconciliation. There was no reconciliation. You see that when godly sorrow comes upon you, and repentance is produced in your life, true repentance, not fake repentance, there is always a reconciling that goes on. In other words, relationships are made right. Relationships with you and God, relationships with you and others. Friend, I want to tell you, when you really repent before Almighty God, you'll start getting, reconciling some relationships. Maybe it's in a marriage with a spouse. Maybe it's with a child. Maybe it's with a, uh, maybe it's with a, a family member. Maybe it's with a friend. Maybe it's with someone that you have offended, someone that you have done wrong. But when true repentance comes in, there'll be a reconciling. And you know what? With these people right here, you don't see no reconciliation, do you? They're still at odds with God. They're still at odds with Moses. And in fact, they even wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb for teaching right that was against their wills. They were against God, and there was no reconciliation. Thinking about this, 
that true repentance really produces reconciliation, getting rights wrong. I think about Matthew in chapter 5. I'll read to you very quickly Matthew chapter 5 and uh, verse 23 and 4. Matthew 5 verse 23 and 24. This is a religious man that goes down to the, to the synagogue, to the house of God. And in Matthew 5 23, Jesus says, uh, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first, be reconciled, there's that word reconciled, to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. What is he saying? Here, this person, Jesus gives an illustration of this man that comes down to the altar to pray. And he said, if you get down here on the altar and you remember that there's something not been reconciled in your life, that there is sin in your life, what true repentance before God will not just push that to the side and say, well, we'll get over that and we'll work, we'll work through it and every, at time uh, allow that to get better. It'll heal with time. Oh, no. What he says, you get down here and the Holy Spirit of God while you're praying shows you some wrong that's in your life, some sin that's in your life, some sin that you have committed against someone else. He said, you go back to him and to that brother that you have offended, that brother that you cussed, that brother that you said something ugly to, that brother that you cheated, that brother that you lied to, that brother that you manipulated or did wrong, you go to them and you get that right, then you can come back down here and we'll be right. You see, true repentance always produces reconciliation and it brings a desire to make wrongs right. Friend, we should have an attitude of repentance. We should have an attitude of forgiveness in our lives. And we, when we really repent before God, there'll be reconciliation. And if we as a church are really praying for awakening, I'm taking you somewhere here, if we're really praying for God to do something on March 10th and we're not even going to say to the 13th, we're going to say God, as long as God wants to go, if God's going to really do something, you know, he's, uh, we've got to be right before God ourselves. And if we can't expect the world to repent when we're not even willing to repent in our lives... Uh, and and you, you might say, well, I've repented. You might be like these here and say, well, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm in church every Sunday and I'm doing right. And I'm going, uh, friend, don't you understand? If you've got all and you've got anger in your heart and you've got things that you're unwilling to repent of, you're not really repentant. And the sad thing about that is that's why I believe that most Christians are not leading people to salvation. They're not seeing fruit of God in their life. They're not seeing salvations in local congregations. They're not seeing churches grow. Why? Because they are not manifesting the presence of God in their life because they have harbored sin and they're unwilling to repent of it. These people have not given real, true repentance. They have given attitude repentance. You see, when you really begin to when you really begin to have what we call true repentance, not just this lingo, we've got, we've got religious lingo, and we say, yeah, you've got to repent, yeah, you've got to do this, but we never apply it to ourselves, do we? And we look at ourselves, and we look at ourselves in the mirror. True repentance is, is, is in Psalms 51, when David looks, what does he say? My sin is ever before me. My sin is ever before me. Everywhere I go, I see my sin. And that's what true repentance is when God's working in people's lives, that we are sensitive to sin in our lives, and we begin to repent. And it's not just about getting drunk, or it's not just about running around, or it's not just about this and big, what we would call big sins, but sometimes it's just a little old gossiping habit you got, or mishandling something wrong, or your little cussing habit you got uh, regularly when you get around the boys, and you know it's kind of cool to say the cuss word. Or be like some of these big managers and executives when they get into big business meetings. You know, it's kind of cool to give the right cuss words at the right time in the midst of the congregation. Everybody kind of giggles. Friend, I want to tell you that when we get thoroughly right with God, we will be sensitive to sin. These people were not because we see no remorse in their actions. We see no reconciliation, getting things right. Uh, you know, every, every revival I've heard of, even going back to the Burlington Revival, a few years ago up in Burlington, North Carolina, you know what the first factor was is that people in that church started getting right, a regular old revival, and all of a sudden people started uh, giving a spirit of forgiveness and hugging and, and, and patching up things that had been done wrong from a long time ago. And in many of the revivals that I hear of, that's always the initiating force is that the people that were in the presence of that congregation began to get things right and be reconciled back to their brethren and their brothers, it's important for us to be right with God, and it's important for us to be right with man. 
And I'm going to tell you what, that's easy to preach. But I'm telling you what, there's some people out there, it's just hard to find that forgiveness for, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But when you've got real repentance, you know what? The conviction of God and chastening of God that's in your life and being right with God is way more important than holding on and harboring bitterness towards someone else and trying to get that right. Now, I ain't got time to get into all that, but there's they some, some, there some people, there's people that have died that we can't get back right with, can we? How are we supposed to do with that? Have an attitude of forgiveness. Begin to pray, God, I forgive so-and-so. I forgive them what they, what they did. I forgive them for the, what they did, Lord. And that's an attitude of forgiveness. And you begin with the attitude, and for the places that we can go and really get things physically right, we need to do what we can to get those things right with our fellow brethren. Uh, we see that these had, uh, we know that they had not dealt with their sin, and that was the, one of the reasons that this was fake, uh, because there was no remorse, there was no reconciliation, but also there was no restitution. There was no restitution. In other words, there was no payback. Uh, y'all might not remember, but we preached a whole message on this a while back on restitution that when somebody really gets transformed by God, they ought to want to pay back some of the wrong that they did. The thief ought to, hey, the thief ought to start paying back some of them old farmers. He drove up in their, back behind their barn shed and stole some of their plows. If a man gets saved by the blood of Jesus, he ought to start going back to them farmers and giving them some restitution. Bless God, they some people need to come see me once they get saved. Amen. You, you do too. Stole some of your stuff and stole uh, from you and broke in. But what we see is there was no restitution in their attitudes here. I want to read to you very quickly Luke in chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, we see the example of Zacchaeus. Uh, you would remember that story that Zacchaeus uh, was a tax collector and he was a thief and everybody hated Zacchaeus. But you know what? Jesus saved him. And when Jesus saved him, it birthed forth a response of restitution once he had really repented. Luke 19 and verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said, he's been, he's been transformed, he's a believer now. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And grab this, if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Restitution. Zacchaeus said, where I've stolen, I'm going to give them back fourfold. Friend, I want you to understand today that there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people who's been saved that have not been taught the Word of God like they should have been. And there's a bunch of old thieves that were stealing back when they were in high school and in early life. And now that they've been saved, they're still guilty. You don't know why they got feelings of guilt? Boy, I feel bad about stealing from that farmer years ago. I feel bad. Every time you drive across that thing where you stole something, you think, boy, I feel bad. Well, I'll tell you what, you ain't got to feel guilty on it. You know why you feel guilty over it? Because you have not dealt with that sin. You have not restituted the wrong that should have been made right. And you want to know how to make that right? You go back to that farm and you catch him around there and you say, well, he's dead. We'll go to his youngins that own the farm now and say, you know what? I just want to tell you, I stole something from you about 30 years ago and I don't know what it was worth, but here's a $100 bill. I want to pay back wrong and restitute you for what I stole from you. How many of y'all ever heard any good witness, gospel witness testimonies about that? Because when you really get, get right with God, you want to make wrongs right. And you want to restitute. We see all through the Old Testament in the, in the law that it talks about restitution. That if you, if you kill a man by accident, you should restitute. And if an axe, handle fall, axe head falls off a handle and you accidentally kill somebody, this is restitution. If you kill somebody's uh, 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 cow, this is what you should restitute. Friend, I want you to understand today. Now, we can't, there's, this gets heavy and there's a lot of different scenarios here. But friend, where we can pay something back, we need to pay it back. I was preaching a similar message at some point in time years ago, and uh, my neighbor, actually right beside me, is actually uh, some kin uh, to my wife. He said, boy, he came to me about a week or two later. He said, boy, I'm glad you sure preached that. He said, I had somebody that owed me a, a bunch of money for hay and said they brought her side by side up here and dropped it off. <laughs> I said, amen. Praise God. God's word does work, doesn't it? You're guilty over some things you don't need to be guilty over. And that feeling of guilt keeps coming back and it's destroying your life and your walk with God because you hadn't dealt with the sin. And it might be because you've not restituted for that sin. For some things like that that you're guilty over, you know, just go back and pay back what you stole and God will bring a spirit of revival into your life. There was no remorse. There was no reconciliation. There was no restitution. We see here in verse 9 of Luke chapter 19, Jesus 
And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Jesus was convinced, not by just his words, but he was convinced by a heart attitude that wanted to get right, not only with God, but with fellow man. Friend, I want you to understand, I want to be right with God, and I want to be right with man. And there ain't nobody that wants to hold a grudge against nobody better than me. There ain't nobody that wants to have alt and anger and destroy somebody because they done me wrong. That's, that's just self-defense most of the time. But I'd rather be right with God and have power in prayer and the anointing of God upon my life than I would to hold on and make somebody else suffer who did me wrong. Start with an attitude of forgiveness and say, God, I forgive so and so. And keep repeating that. And where it is possible for you to, to make restitution, you do so. And revival will spark forth in your life. Here we look and we see this fake uh, repentance that they had. And we know that it was fake because it was not initiated by God. Secondly, it was not accompanied by faith. Third, they had not dealt with their sin. But fourthly, true repentance never goes against God's word. We know that it was, it was a fake repentance because true repentance never goes against God's word. You'll see it in verse 41 of Numbers 14. Verse 41. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. What did they, transgr what did they transgress against? The commandment of the Lord. The word of the Lord. And we know that true repentance never goes against God's word. You want to know if somebody really got saved or somebody's really repenting? Look at the Word of God. And if you don't see those, uh, those attributes that the Word of God says that believers and people who are repentant have, they probably didn't get real repentance. We understand that true repentance never goes against God's Word. Romans 10 verse 17 says that faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. True repentance and faith come through access of the Word of God and they are always in line with the Word of God. And these people in their repentance were going to uh, try to do something that was going against God's Word. God said, don't you go into land and they were still moving forward. We understand that true repentance never goes against God's Word. But also, uh, lastly, we understand uh, that we understand that this was a fake repentance on behalf of this people, Israel, in Numbers 14, because true repentance must have the presence of the Lord. True repentance must have the presence of the Lord. True repentance must have the presence of the Lord. You see, you, you got to understand that you just don't decide when you're going to get saved. Well, I ain't doing it this week. I'll do it next week, or I'll wait till revival and do it. Oh, no, that's not an attitude. That's not an attitude of repentance, buddy. That's keeping you in the driver's seat. And that's not true repentance. True, true repentance uh, is, uh, must have the presence of the Lord. You see, it takes the Holy Spirit of God dealing with you when you can really repent by faith unto the Lord Jesus Christ. True repentance takes all effort out of man and all ability out of man. True repentance is leaning solely on God. True repentance must have the presence of the Lord. How do you know? Verse 42, look at it. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you. Man, the Lord is not among you. That's a scary thought to have to get up in the morning and know that the Lord wasn't among you. To go into trials of life and know that God wasn't among you. These people, we know that true repentance is, uh, has the presence of the Lord. And here, God not, go not up, verse 42, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten because, before your enemies. Verse 43, and the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword. Why? Because ye are turned away from the Lord. You are what? Turned away from the Lord. The presence of the Lord is not with you. Therefore, the Lord will not what? Be with you. I know that this was fake repentance because a true repentance always is, has the presence of the Lord involved with it. Uh, I think about John chapter 16 and verse 8. If I could read that to you. Uh, Jesus speaking in John chapter 16 uh, and uh, verse 8. Uh, he says uh, this. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit of God, and when the Holy Spirit comes uh, to earth, John chapter 16 and verse 8, he says, And when he is come, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. 
of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. What do we see? That the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, will always be active in repentance of believers and repentance of those who are not believers who are coming unto salvation. You can't do a work of repentance without God. If you could, you would be like David in Psalms 51 and roughly verse 17. For the sacrifice, uh, God, uh, God, you're not sacrificed with burnt offerings. Neither desire thou uh, the sacrifices of animals. But the, the desire of God is a broken spirit and a con broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. You see, if we could in our own effort achieve repentance, if we could in our own effort achieve uh, the, the favor of God, those people would have achieved it there. And they'd have went into that land in their own accord, and they'd have done anything they'd have had to do to get the presence of God with them. But friend, I want you to understand here that it is, the repentance is not available in man's efforts and works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10, uh, that faith is, uh, is a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not in your effort. God's presence is always in the midst of true repentance. Jesus will reprove the world of sin. And unless Jesus and the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, we can't even understand what reprovation would be in our lives. So we look and we see that we know it's faith because it was not initiated by God. It was not accompanied by faith. They had not dealt with their sin. True repentance never goes against God's word. And true repentance must have the presence of the Lord. But one thing that we can notice is that real repentance. What does it look like? What does real repentance look like? We know it's not Numbers chapter 14 in Children of Israel. That was a fake repentance. But I think true repentance would be uh, over there in Psalms 51 where David says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities, and cleanse me from my sin. For against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when I speak and clear when thou judgest. Behold, thou, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin, and my mother conceived me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be watered in the snow. Uh, make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all my transgressions. Oh, friend, when we truly come to true repentance, that is our prayer. Psalms 51, it's in the Bible right there on the front cover. Because that's our life and that's our prayer. True repentance is this. When David, after he's been caught in sin, he's been caught red-handed and there's so much that God has done against him. But what did he say? He looked up and he said, Oh God, forgive me of my sins, God. I can't even go back to where I was before unless you help me to get there. You can't get right on your own. You've got to have the presence of God and you've got to do it through His way. Repentance and confession of sin. And God will reward you. True repentance is David. The cry and a plea to Almighty God for his sins, having sinned against a holy and a righteous God, not just having been caught. We think about Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son, that great story. All oh, the prodigal son, he takes his inheritance that the father gives him who loves him, and he runs off into the world. He goes down to Egypt for a while. Not literally, but the world and sin and Satan. And he expounds everything, and the devil has his way with him, and the world has his way with him. All of his money's gone. He has nothing. He has nothing. He doesn't have a, is it all right to say this, a pot to pee in? That's probably not good from the pulpit, but hey, that's, that's where we're at. We country folk. We can, we can work with it. And he looks to a holy father that's back home. He says, you know what? Our hired servants are looked after better than what I am. And he says, just perhaps maybe I can go back to my father and repent. And not he'll put me back in my normal place. Maybe he'll just give me a little bit of clothes and a, dog, a little bit of dog food to carry me through. But what did that father do? When he saw the true repentance of a son, he gave him the back, the position that he was supposed to be in. Can I tell you this morning, maybe you've sinned against God and you feel like God's done with you. If you would just simply come to the time that you would allow godly sorrow to come into your heart and you would quit excusing your sin. And saying, it, yeah, that ain't that bad. I'm, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, trying to get things right in your life. And you keep pushing it off and pushing it off and trying to hide it and push it all off and delaying it and procrastinating it. 
when God's trying to get you just to flat out deal with it. But if you'll yield and let God begin to deal with you and begin to confess that sin and begin to work of progressively uh, confessing that sin and getting it out of your life, God will begin to give revival in your life and healing to you. Not only that, we've already read the church of Corinth. What did they do? Man, they were wrong. They were flat out. Man, I can't believe they was even saved, to be honest about it. When you read 1 Corinthians, all the mess that was going on. But Paul rebuked them harshly. And they had a choice. They could believe God's word. Or they could deny God's word and live in their own way. And that was a church and a congregation that said, you know what, we have been wrong. Let us confess before Almighty God. And that church received the anointing of God and the approval of Paul and the approval of God because they repented of their sins. Frank, can I tell you, there's only one thing that hinders the victorious Christian life. There's only one thing, and that's an unwillingness to repent the right way before Almighty God. What does that look like? I don't know. I've said I'm sorry a thousand times. Quit saying you're sorry and just fall on your face before God and say, God, I'm a sinner. And quit excusing your side. If you're like me, you'll, tell every, you, you'll, you'll, you'll take it to court. You've got a court r- session running in your mind all the time about what they did to you and what, how they did wrong and this ain't right and that ain't right. And, you know, you, you're the judge and the jury. Who can tell you if you're right or wrong? It's not going to ever help. It's not going to solve anything. The greatest thing that you and I can do is just say, God, forgive me for what I have done wrong. And then say, God, I pray that you forgive them for what they did wrong. And God will begin a process of revival in your life. Friend, give it to God. If you've never been saved by the blood of Jesus this morning, you need to repent and believe the gospel. What does the Bible say? If you confess with your mouth and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Friend, maybe you're here today and maybe you just want to see revival and you're not seeing the anointing in the presence of God. Search your heart. might be some things you covered up. There's an old preacher that used to say all the time, any sin that you cover, God will uncover. But any sin that you uncover, God will cover it. Begin to pull back the callous of your heart and have an open heart before God. And even make yourself vulnerable for God to remind you of things you sure don't want to be reminded of. But in confessing those, God will begin to cover them. And you won't have the guilt You won't have to guilt anymore. You won't have to guilt. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning. We love you. We praise your holy name. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the message this morning. God, move in our hearts. God, may you begin to dig and crawl through our souls and our spirits. God, may you begin to show us, yea, the deep things of God. And, Lord, the things that are against you that are deep in our hearts, Lord. Dig deep in us, Lord. God, help us to have a willingness to repent, O God. Thou God of thy salvation, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray. Holy Ghost, do thy inner work. God, we yield to you, Lord. We submit to you. And God, we pray, Holy Ghost of God, do thy chastening work. Cultivate our hearts. Turn us upside down. Uh, Wreck our souls, Lord. God, that we may confess the sins that are hindering our walk with you. God, we're looking for revival. We're looking for awakening. Not only in our hearts, Lord, in our congregation, but across this county, this Uh, county this country and this world Lord Father in the name of Jesus grant us repentance and help us to do it by faith in the right way God give us a willingness Lord to get right with you help us to restitute mankind where we can help us to be reconciled to our brethren Father it's in Jesus Christ holy and precious name we pray Amen as we stand and